right. So, in the last class, uh, yeah, so we have been talking about the use of finely ground limestone as an additive to Portland cement. As we all know, up to 5 percent of Portland cement manufacture, you are permitting what we call as performance improvers. And these performance improvers also include limestone. Sometimes people use slag, sometimes they use uh, fly ash. So, uh, but what we are primarily interested in is uh, what will happen when we start introducing more limestone in the system because that leads to a major advantage with respect to cutting down the overall CO2 potential of the cement. So, 6 to 20 percent is what is permissible in Portland limestone blends uh, that are available in EN and ASTM. But even beyond that, if we have an opportunity to go for more limestone in lower grade concrete, we should look at that option because there is definitely uh, some impact that can really have on the concrete choices for low grades, let us say M20, M25, where we now do not have to rely on too much cement being used, right. Now, moving on, we really want to look at this system where limestone can interact with a second supplementary cementing material, okay. So, here what we want to do is try out a new chemistry about which we have discussed primarily earlier uh, based on the availability of calcite to react with the aluminate to form carboaluminates. So, the idea is to have a ternary blended system where you have cement clinker and of course, you also have gypsum, right. And you have two supplementary cementing materials. One is of course, your fly ash or slag or calcine clay and second supplementary material is your limestone. So, what you end up doing is let us say these are the phases that you form when cement hydrates, right. When cement containing some limestone in its itself hydrates, these are the phases that are actually present and the densities of those phases are also given here. We know the density of cement is about 3.15. So, most cement phases are in the same range of density. Unhydrated cement will have that level of density. But when you hydrate, the CSH that you produce gets a density of about 2.2 or 2.3. Calcium hydroxide is almost the same, 2.2. But interestingly, if you look at the Ettringite phase, density is lower. What does this mean? If I form more Ettringite, what, what does that mean? You fill up more space. Forming more Ettringite means you are filling up more space. So, if I choose a system where I can actually increase the Ettringite formation, I can fill up more space. But what really happens in Portland cement? The Ettringite gets converted to monosulphate and the density is going up. Right. So, now my system is not as efficiently packed, but what will happen if I put limestone and uh, another supplementary cementing material in conjunction with my cement phases is I will end up with a different blend of hydration products. Of course, I will have CSH, calcium hydroxide, ettringite and monosulphate still, but I end up forming additional CSH or CASH by consuming calcium hydroxide. I, we talked about the fact that calcium hydroxide is a well defined crystalline structure because of which its volume filling ability is not that good. Although as a material it is solid, it is hard and so on, but it is not able to fill up volume efficiently. Secondly, you also have the formation of additional hydrate phases monocarbonate and hemicarbonate. So, you have of course, you are removing unhydrated phases or reacting unhydrated phases to actually form these hydrated phases. But interestingly, what also ends up happening in the system is that the ettringite that is forming early stabilizes. Why? Why should that stabilize? What? How is ettringite formed? Because of aluminate and sulphate reacting, right? Aluminate and sulphate react to form ettringite. But in normal Portland cement systems, there is a lot of aluminate available. So, that aluminate interacts with ettringite to produce monosulphate. But now, I have introduced a system where I have carbonate also present and this alumina wants to combine with the carbonate and start producing monocarbonate or hemicarbonate leaving the ettringite free. So, what will happen to the ettringite? It will remain stable in the system and if you remember we discussed the fact that sulphate resistant cement systems are designed from the perspective of low C3A so that ettringite that forms at early stages remains stable. So, when you have such a system, 
the stability of ettringite is ensured and this ettringite will remain stable for a long period of time and not really decompose to AFM. AFM formation is going to reduce because you are forming other AFM phases in terms of carbonates. You are not forming monosulphate anymore, you are forming monocarbonate but you are still taking care of the alumina. So, the ettringite that is already formed remains as such. So, I will just talk about this with respect to how products evolve in a cementitious system. This is a typical Portland cement. We know that beyond a certain period of hydration, CSH starts forming rapidly. In the long term, CSH occupies the most volume inside cement paste. We have next calcium hydroxide, then we have calcium aluminate hydrate and ettringite that starts forming in the early stages decomposes to give rise to monosulphate, oh sorry not that one, this one. Ettringate that starts forming at the early stages starts giving rise to monosulphate and in the long term the stable products are CSH, calcium hydroxide, calcium aluminate hydrate and monosulphate in the long term for a plain Portland cement. So, what happens in the presence of limestone, calcium and clay or limestone and slag or limestone and fly ash is that you do not have this conversion of ettringate to monosulphate. So, ettringate remains stable, monosulphate itself formation of it is reduced or almost avoided. You start forming monocarbonate and hemicarbonate. So, hemicarbonate is 0 0.5 carbon or 0 0.5 CO2 molecules of CO2 in the structure of the carboaluminate. Monocarbonate is 1 CO2. Okay. So, basically it is calcium aluminum carbonate or if you have to write it correctly in terms of cement chemistry, it will be a mixture of calcium oxide, aluminum oxide and carbon dioxide. So, this is a monocarbonate system. Of course, I am not writing the stoichiometry correctly in terms of how much calcium, how much alumina and so on. But when you have a aluminate source present like fly ash or slag or calcium clay, it will combine with the carbonate to start forming these carboaluminate phases, right. So, you start forming carboaluminate phases which are then filling up more of the space that is available. You start consuming calcium hydroxide and increasing the CSH formation. So, in other words, you are causing the system to get lowered with respect to its porosity and in general lowering porosity will also lead to low, uh, lowering the permeability of the system. Lower permeability implies better durability. Okay. So, porosity reduction generally the experimental re results suggest that porosity reduction is not so much as to cause a major enhancement in strength, but the permeability reduction is significant and that leads to a major enhancement in durability. So, these are the main aspects that you see stabilization of ettringite, increased carboaluminate phases, lowered portlandite content and increased calcium aluminum silicate hydrate. So, overall your volume filling ability of the hydration products gets better and you have less interconnected porosity available in your system. So, just to put this in perspective, if you have limestone effects and cementitious systems, limestone is a fine filler. So, it will obviously have a filler effect, it will improve packing and reduce capillary space just by the fact that it is a fine material. Because limestone gives calcium, the surfaces we discussed this earlier that fine particles offer a chance of nucleation of CSH on the surfaces and that is what is happening with limestone. The carbonate reacts to form monocarbonate and hemicarbonate. So, additional hydration products form and your ettringite gets stabilized. So, limestone has a real beneficial effect in cementitious system. So, what is the problem? Everybody knows this why have they, they not been using it? In Portland cement also we have alumina, alumina available. Why do not we simply use limestone cement? Why cannot we do that? Alumina is there in Portland cement also. C3A you can increase if you want, right? And you can use calcite or calcium carbonate as a replacement, as a performance improver, higher quantities also. Portland limestone cement is basically based on that. What what is happening? Yeah, maybe you will start compromising on the strength a little bit if only limestone is present because you are not forming any additional CSH, you are not forming any 
additional CSH if just limestone is present, right? What else? Main thing is the reactivity of the limestone itself. Only a fraction of the calcite and only if it is very fine sized, okay, will dissolve and be available for reaction. So, you are not going to be able to have a large quantity available. So, in a use of limestone as a performance improver, 5 percent is used. So, there is not enough of limestone available to give enough reactive carbonate in your system. If you put 10 or 15 percent, you are increasing the chance that there is more reactive carbonate available in your system, right. And by providing an alumino silicate like fly ash or slag or calcine clay, you give additional alumina which is reactive to combine with the carbonate in the system. So, there are obvious benefits which you cannot get by plain Portland cement or even Portland limestone cement. So, that is where you can actually harness that benefit in the case of your ternary blended systems. Okay, anyway, that is getting too specific, we do not have to go to that extent to understand the system. So, what happens when limestone is used in combination with supplementary materials? In general, when calcine clays are used, we know that uh, intercalation of uh, PCEs and other superplasticizers can take place in the sheets of the calcine clay, but in the presence of limestone, you, you are able to actually offset that effect to some extent. It gives better flowability to your system. In fact, uh, for even for uh, your plastering, to improve the applicability of plaster, limestone is an excellent material to replace Portland cement because it gives that softness to apply that plaster. Okay. Uh, in fly ash systems, when early strength is compromised because of the slow reaction of fly ash, the fact that your limestone can provide this increased C3S hydration by causing nucleation of CSH will improve the early age strength also. So, with fly ash, you can offset some of the early strength problems that you have with fly ash. And generally, we can expect that there is going to be an improved performance in sulphur attack because ettringite is stable and in chloride exposure. Why? Alumina is there, it will bind the chloride. So, in chloride exposure also your improvement will happen with durability, but problem will be the resistance to carbonation because you are cutting down your calcium hydroxide significantly because calcium hydroxide was earlier getting used only for the pozzolanic reaction. Now, it is also getting used to form monocarbonate and hemicarbonate. The reaction of limestone with alumina has to happen in the presence of calcium hydroxide to produce this carbonate phases, which I will show you in just a minute. Yeah, so this is the reaction. This is your uh, metakaolin, let us say when we are considering limestone calcine clay cement where cement is replaced partially by limestone and calcine clay combination. You have the alumino silicate given by the metakaolin or calcine clay and the limestone or calcite given by the limestone. What is the difference between calcite and limestone? What is calcite and what is limestone? basic geology, science. Limestone is the rock, right? Calcite is a mineral. Calcite is a mineral. What is the difference between a rock and a mineral? One, your younger brothers and sisters at home will be asking you the same question. What is the difference between rock and mineral? No, no. I mean, ore is different. Ore is any rock that you mine for a profit, right? But what is a mineral? Can I call water as a mineral? Can I call fly ash as a mineral? Okay, the official definition of a mineral involves the fact that the material should have some well defined structure. So, usually a mineral is a crystalline material, 
right? A mineral basically is a crystalline material which has a definite structure which repeats, right? So, calcite is the mineral here, but limestone is the rock which is composed of many such minerals in combination. It may also contain other impurity minerals like quartz, for instance. Okay. Quartz is another mineral and it may be present in some limestone also. Clay may be present in them. What, what are some clay minerals that you know of? We talked about one here. Kaolinite, kaolinite is a mineral. Illite is a mineral. Montmorillonite, all these are minerals. Okay. But clay is the generic name given to the species. It is more of a geotechnical name based on the classification that we do for soils, right? But the actual mineral is something else, okay. Anyway, coming back to the fact that monocarbonate formation involves alumina and calcite along with lime generated by cement hydration to form this monocarbonate structure. So, calcium, alumino, carbonate, hydrate. Now, of course, between calcium and carbon, you can see that cement chemists have do some cheating and put a line under the carbon to say that it is not calcium, but it is carbon, okay. If you take this equation to a real chemist, they will throw you out of the room saying, what are you talking about? Anyway, so these were some early works done by researchers on limestone, calcium and clay cement, where uh, they clearly showed that the one day strengths as compared to plain Portland cement probably were not the same, but when you do three or seven day strengths, the calcine clay usage along with limestone, even at a 45 percent replacement level. So, here it was 30 percent calcine clay and 15 percent limestone, 30 percent calcine clay and 15 percent limestone. So, by three days, the clays that were rich in kaolinite, right? For instance, the Burgess clay and the India 1 clay, you can clearly see by three days, they have a strength that is almost equal to that of Portland cement mortar. By 7 days, even the cement that is 50 percent of kaolinite has overtaken the plain OPC in terms of the strength. Right, so that is the advantage here. We are replacing 45 percent of the cement and putting in this calcine clay limestone combination, but we are able to get a strength performance at 7 days even with an impure calcine clay. We do not have to rely on metacaolin anymore. We can go for an impure calcine clay. If you go to any of these china clay quarries where they are looking for the white china clay, there is tons and tons of overburden material which is not getting used. So, a lot of this uh, material overburden plus all your impure clays may contain between 40 to 60 percent kaolinite. And it has been shown that such clays could be good enough in a system like this. So, that is why you see this 50 percent clay itself is able to produce a strength which is better at 7 days than Portland cement. Interestingly, even a 20 percent kaolinite clay is able to reach 75 percent of the cement strength and that is really a very good achievement, right. That means this material which has mostly impurities, not kaolinite is still able to do this excellently. So, that is what the purpose of using large replacements of cement is and we try to come to ternary combinations where we are harnessing the synergy between the calcite and the calcine clay. 